Many thanks, Colin. Um, good morning, folks. Thank you for coming along. Uh, so as Colin has uh, already said, my name is Brian Fraser. Uh, I'm a community health development practitioner and I'm employed by the Southeastern Health and Social Care Trust. Uh, I am delighted to host today's webinar um, to celebrate International Men's Day, which takes place tomorrow, actually, on the 19th of November. Uh, as you may have read in the advertising poster, this is the first time that the six Northern Ireland Health Trusts, the local councils and a range of voluntary organisations have joined forces in Northern Ireland to deliver an event this size, which is focused particularly on men's health. Uh, as a planning group, we thought it was specifically or very important to work together and we thought that we could make a bigger impact uh, and target a larger audience across Northern Ireland. And indeed, the numbers here today definitely reflect that. As you'll also have seen then, the theme of today's webinar is turning it around. And we have two excellent speakers who will share their stories um, about overcoming personal, professional uh, and, health, and health challenges. Paul and Oshin here are two speakers give a unique insight, um, discuss very openly and honestly um, how they have turned their lives around and faced some of those challenges in their lives. To give you an idea of the format for today then, uh, Paul will speak first and then Oshin will share his story uh, before we will give you the audience an opportunity as Colin has discussed to ask some questions at the end. So without further delay then I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the day Paul Ferris. Um, so Paul is going to turn his camera and uh, unmute himself for us now and then Colin is going to play our introductory uh, video of Paul uh, doing some of his magic back in the day. The move certainly paid off, as John Anderson's ballooning through ball was touched on by Chris Waddle for the Northern Ireland Youth International to drive in his first senior goal for the club. What a moment for him. Good morning, Paul. How are you? Morning, Brian. Very good. I peaked too soon. I came on the screen about two minutes before I should have done, but that's fine. No, don't worry about that. There's no problem. Um, so, Paul, obviously, you and I know each other quite well, and we've, we've spoke quite a bit over the years. And um, But there are other people on the on the screen or the audience here today that might not know you as well and might not know your, your story. Um, so I wonder, would it be a good place to start just by uh, sharing a, a wee bit about who exactly is Paul for us? And, and maybe then also introducing your book, uh, uh, which has won multiple awards, The Boy in the Shed, um, because I think that might be a nice way of introducing some of the challenges that you faced early in life. Yeah, I mean, uh, what uh, well, The Boy in the Shed, a good way to start any conversation. I'd like to start it with a heart attack. So I, I, had, a, I, had, a, I had an unexpected heart attack when I was 48, which is nearly eight years ago now. Uh, and I find myself, Brian, lying in a hospital bed in Newcastle upon time, where I'm speaking to you from now, and I've lived for the last 40 years. Um, feeling a bit sorry for myself. Two o'clock in the morning, you know, all the lights are out. The, you're wired up, and you and you and if you can't reflect on your life, then you never will. And really, the the germ of the book was born that night. And 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 the title of the book itself comes from from the fact that when I was five years old, my 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 mother had a heart attack when I slept beside her, and I didn't know. And and typically in those days, no one really told me what happened. She just disappeared and came back two weeks later, and she was a bit less than she was, and I knew she was, and she she sent me out to play. And instead of going out to play, I'd climb in an old coat bunker behind the house and I'd look through the kitchen window at her because I, I thought, of, well, if I'm watching her, then God won't take her because he tried to take her when I was asleep. And my mother's illness really, alongside the troubles, religion and football, dominated my childhood in the 70s. And I'd like to say that, that her illness was, you know, her heart attack was the, the end of it for her, but it was just the beginning for her. And she had her second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh heart attacks before I was 12, and, and including two cardiac arrests. It fundamentally shaped me as a person because it made me quite a shy boy, I think, and, and desperate to be near her constantly. Uh, troubles were all around us, religion was all around us, but football was always my escape. And and I was always destined to be a footballer. I was I was just a talented footballer from a young 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 age. And I was I found myself at Man United when I was 11 years old and, and absolutely hated every minute of it, not because it was Man United, just because I just didn't want to be away from home. And I went back and begged my mother not, not to let me go across the water again and, I, and I'd failed my 11 plus because our house was petrol bombed and I, and I kind of just, I just it, it, but, I, but I knew I was a bright boy and I, I wanted to concentrate in the school and I did. But it was always going to, it was always going to come and get me the football thing and I was kind of a reluctant footballer in the end. When I was 16 I went to Newcastle United on trial. 
two weeks later, I was living in Newcastle. Uh, what we, one minute you don't know anything about Newcastle as a city, and two minutes, two weeks later, you're living there, and I'm living away from family, away from friends, and it's felt a long way from home. And it was a, it was a desperate time for me, and I, I don't know how I survived longer than a week, but I did. And the football went amazingly well. The football went remarkably well, and, and within six months, and at 16 years old, I became the youngest player ever to play for Newcastle United. And, and to give you an idea how young that is, I, I played in the May and came home in the June, and my friends from school were doing the O-levels in the June. And they're looking at me thinking, oh, you're some kind of football and superstar. And I was thinking, I just want to be doing levels with you. I just want to be here. But um, but the football continued to go well until I was 19. I got a really nasty injury and I didn't realise it at the time, but I was effectively finished from that point. And I spent two years trying to you know, be a futile attempt to get fit. And at 21, the football club that I thought was going to be my life shipped me out the back door. And I, and I find myself going from being a professional footballer to being... Effectively homeless, actually, and 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 uh, with no job, went to the dole office, and I'm standing in the dole office, and someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, Are "You Paul first, plays for Newcastle United," and I thought, "Well, not today, no." Um, and and I was in the wrong building, and the woman said, "You're not fit to work. Go to the welfare office." So I so I went to the welfare office, told my story, and came out with a, an emergency check and a bit less dignity than I had when I entered it. And 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 that I was having that conversation with my mum who was really upset about what was happening in my life. And we, we had one conversation one night on the phone and, I, and she was upset. And I said, look, go make a cup of tea and I'll have a cup of tea and we'll talk in an hour. And, and I made a cup of tea and she died. And she died at the, at just at the worst possible moment in my life when everything had gone wrong for me. And it felt like someone pushed the lights out. And I've been being brutally honest, it feels like the lights haven't come on quite as brightly ever again since for me. But, um, but I find myself at a really... Supportive girlfriend is now my wife, I'm proud to say, and she she went and got us a council flat and she got a job and and I wallowed in self-pity for a while and then eventually found my way back through education and, and went into Newcastle College and eventually got a physiotherapy degree and walked back through the front door of Newcastle United, the club that had shipped me out sort of seven years later. It was a very proud moment. Stayed there for 13 years through some great times with several great big managers, Kevin Keegan, Brian Sooners, Ruth Hullett, Kenny Lavise, Bobby Robson. Amazing times, but somewhere in the middle of it, I felt like it wasn't for me. And I decided I wanted to do a master's degree, and a sensible person would do a master's degree in sports science. And I did mine in history of ideas, which is, if anybody out there knows what that is, please let me know. Uh, exasperated, trying to get a pay rise, and the chief executive one day, in the end, I said, but I've got a, I've got a master's degree now. And he said, oh, what's that in? And I said, history of ideas. And he said, well, that'll get you 50% of the left wall then, Paul, won't it? And I thought, well, I went home to Geraldine, and I just said, you know what, I don't want to be here. And she said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to study law. And she said, well, how are you going to do that? I said, well, I was thinking about selling half the house, and I'm chopping it in half, and she said, that's a good idea because she's as mad as me. And and I studied law for two years while I was at the football club, and 2006 I left and went to bar school and was called to the bar 2007, and was happily practicing criminal law as a pupil barrister in 2008 and got a phone call from Alan Shearer, who you know, um, needs no introduction to many people in this, I'm sure. And he said, I'm taking over to Hampton Football Club and I want you to run the sports medicine, sports science side of the football for me, and I want you to do that with me wherever I go, and you can be my right-hand man. And I thought, I sat in the room with him and some business in Southampton, and they promised me the earth. And I jumped off my legal career, whether it was my ego, whatever it was, I don't know what it was, I jumped off to go with Alan, watch Sky Break and use, and someone else took over Southampton. And I'm then in a bit of a hole because I'm, I've, I've jumped off my legal career and I can't be a physiotherapist. And eventually we went into Newcastle United, so it wasn't too long to wait. And we were there for eight weeks trying to keep the club up. And we didn't manage it, but we shook hands on a deal at the end of that season, which was a remarkable thing, going to change our lives again. Never heard a thing from the people at the football club. From that moment forward and now I was in the deeper hole and the budget that I had to look after the other half of the house was gone and I had to sell it and and start again and and I got a job at Speedflex where I'm now chief executive and I was working happily working really hard making that work and the heart attack happened um and then I, and then I wrote I wrote the boy in the shed about the journey I just talked to you about and when I finished when I finished the boy in the shed I um I hadn't got a publisher yet, and between finishing it and getting the publisher, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Um, so I went in to have my prostate removed. I think just before I had it removed, I sent the book off to some agents, who sent it, and they sent it off to some publishers, and um, I had my prostate removed, and a week later I had some sepsis and anemia, and I wasn't very well, and, and, and when I was lying in the hospital bed with sepsis and anemia, I got an offer of, I got an offer of a book deal with a boy in the shed. And it was the most from Holland Scotland, one of the biggest publishers in the world, really. And it was a remarkable thing. And I'd written a silly old book years before called An Irish Heartbeat that no one ever read and self-published. And someone contacted me that same week and said, can we take the film rights options? And that was like, it was like a miracle happening when you're in your worst moment. That happened. Um, I'd like to say that they, 
prostate, the prostate, prostate uh, removal did the job, but it didn't for me. So a year later, just as the book was being released, um, I had some radiotherapy and hormone treatment to sort out, to sort out some stubborn cancer cells. Uh, but I'm, you know, the, the book, as you said, went on to win incredible amount of awards. It's since been optioned for film and TV. And I spent the last, actually two things, I spent the last three years writing another manuscript that no one wants to publish. And I've actually just written a follow-up to The Boy in the Shed dealing with, dealing with this journey in prostate cancer that I'm on, which in many ways has been the biggest challenge for me. Um, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm very proud to say that that, that, that follow-up will be published in April by Bloomsbury. Um, and I guess, Brian, just to finish this introduction, I genuinely hand on heart. I have heart disease and I have prostate cancer and I'm 56 years old and slightly overweight. You can't see me, I'm quite... I genuinely think my best days are ahead of me. And I genuinely believe that. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions you have for me. And I hope I haven't rushed through that too much and you've understood me okay. No, thank you, Paul. Right. You've just answered all my questions, though. So <laughs> you've left me hanging. But um, <laughs> no, I, I suppose um, there is a lot of research into childhood trauma and how that um, shapes people in later life. Um, and I suppose when you look back on the, on the challenges that you faced at such a young age, I know you've already said that that maybe shaped the man you were, but maybe explain that a wee bit more and, and how those challenges at such a, a, an early age shaped you in later life. Well, I think, I mean, I think my mother's, my mother's, my mother's, and I think of all the things in my life, uh, being five years old and being frightened of the thing that, that you get most of your, you know, the thing and the person that you get most of your comfort from that you love most in the world, that you, you know, you know might disappear. Um, I think it makes you makes you it, it can't make you anything other than insecure, and it makes you insecure about relationships, and it makes you insecure about about the stability of, of what stability what, what stability means, and what what what, what you know. You, and, and so I basically spend my life almost searching for an anchor and searching for searching searching for a place to call home and to be to be. And, and, and I'm and I'm always fearful that that, that I, I keep my family very close to me, and I'm always fearful that that that, that someday that, that that moment when they're not there or, or that something. Something happens. That 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 bit. My mother's my mother's illness was the most dominant factor in my childhood. But then I mentioned the troubles before. The troubles were everywhere in our. We were we were you know uh, the troubles were everywhere around us. But but when it comes into your, I know people have more trouble than this. But when it comes into your home, and you're 11 years old, and you know you see your, you know you get your house is petrol bombed, and you and you see your you know you, you get dragged out of bed, and you see your front room on fire, and you're just standing there in your underpants watching you watching everybody you love trying to put the fire out, and you know that they're good people, and something bad's happened. It also shapes. It also shapes. It maybe makes you slightly, maybe slightly cynical about life in general, and a bit, a bit less trusting in general. Yeah, so re resilience football is something that, that maybe is very important, or it's something you'd learned at a very young age that you had to be resilient, that you had to be a fighter. And I, and I know in your um, book, the boy in the shed, Alan Shear writes it forward, and he describes you as a fighter. But it seems like you had to be a fighter from a very young age. I mean, I don't want to get into a, a, a class conversation, but if you if if you if you if you're, if you're born into a working class background, when, when the you know when the when the football career finished and it didn't expect it to finish, when that finishes, when I say I'm a fact to be homeless, you 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 have no support system. You haven't got a, a mom and dad who can come and bail you out and do whatever it is. So that 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 taught me. I was kind of that age, that age at 21, when I looked around and I thought, actually, this world's not going to help me here if I don't help myself. I'm going to have to I'm going to have to do something here, otherwise I'm I'm stuck. You know, the, the football's gone. You have no no education. Where do you go? So you either you either at that point you stand still or you take a step forward, and that's all I've ever done in my life. I just I just take a step forward, and sometimes a step forward I've taken is a step forward in the wrong direction. But I always think actually just move, just 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 try and get yourself to somewhere else because no one else is going to help you here. So you got to go. You, you talk about stepping forward, Paul, and I know we've discussed this before, but. Um, I suppose for the, the people in the audience that are maybe at a time when they're struggling with challenges, um, is that how you've overcame the majority of the challenges that you've experienced in life is just by just initially taking that step, whether it's the right step or not? Yeah, I think I think when you when the big traumas come, it would be it would be when the big traumas come, you have to take time to absorb them. Obviously, and you're not in the position to step forward. I think you just got you you're 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 in pain sometimes and you're in a place that, that you didn't want to be. But but in my case, in my case, I've always had, you know, I had the support of my. I've been very fortunate. I've got I've got my now wife who's been my girlfriend since we were kids, and and, and I've always had her who's been there beside me when, when I had when I've been ready to make that move, who supported me. But I I genuinely, and I tell my own kids this, 
anything in life that I've ever achieved in my life or anywhere I've ever been in my life. You know, the, the, the initial the initial bit is me overcoming my inertia to go and do something, just to go and make a make a move, even if I'm terrified of it or if I don't even know where it's going to end up. That's always been something I would definitely, even now when I say to you, my best days are, are still ahead of me. You can write one book and that's fine, but actually trying to write another one and then another one, that's where the, that's where the excitement comes, I think. And that's why you're continuing to write then? Well, I continue to write to prove to myself that I could do it. I always have this insecurity that maybe it was a mistake and they published the book by mistake and all those people might be wrong. So, so, so I always have that, you know, that imposter syndrome, that doubt that I could, maybe, maybe, that was a, maybe that was just a complete fluke. And then I wrote a second manuscript and no one wanted it, so I convinced myself the first one was a fluke. And then I just, I just go again and try the next one. And I'm, I'm, so it, it is that, it is that I have a, a, a inbuilt fear of an inbuilt fear of failure as well. I don't know where that comes from. Whether it comes from the football not working the way it was meant to. Meant to. I also think go back to my mother's stuff. I also think a lot of stuff I've done in my life later in life is almost the day I spoke to my mother and the day she died. I was in a very bad place. I was I had no job. I was injured. I was homeless. Uh, it's almost it's almost a message back to her to say it, it turned out okay in the end. I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose looking back, Paul, you've talked about um, taking that step forward and sometimes that step not always being the right decision. <laughs> Is there times that you look back and think, I wish I hadn't taken that step or you regret some of those actions that you took at the time when you were in facing those challenges? You know what I always say, and I say this to my kids every day, I mean, if the, the, road on, the road to unhappiness, I think, is to take that step and then go full of regret. I think if I take, if I take the step, like I decided to jump off a legal career when I had your... your, your you're 95 meters down a 100 meter track, and who jumps off there? Only only fools and me jump off there. But I did it, and I did it, and I did, and, and and I did it because I thought it was the right thing to do. And actually, it's taken me in a whole different place. So I, so I look back maybe with a bit of a pang sometimes, but I, but I try very hard not to regret it because I just think this life's short and it just takes you in different places. And actually, I wouldn't have got I wouldn't have got the boy in the shed. I wouldn't have got the book if I'd just gone from the football career into the legal stuff and the it would have been a different book. And I've, got a, you see, I've had much more life experiences because of some of the mistakes I've made. Yeah. Uh, Paul, I've heard you refer to, and you mentioned it earlier about the heart attack and you started the conversation with, with your heart attack, but I've also heard you describe that as a moment of darkness you know, or, or a stop the clock moment in your words. Can you maybe explain that more and what was your thought process at that time? Well, it's a, it's a, it is a, an absolute say hello to your mortality definitely <laughs> you know you just you just one minute you just sailed along with them and then dealing with all the bits and pieces that are there and then you know I, I was a physiotherapist dealing with high profile footballers being the person who would encourage them and cajole them when is your own heart and it's it's it's, it's at the very the very center of your being and who you are and it lets you down um it's a it's a fearful place to be you don't feel you you you, you just feel I felt very vulnerable and I felt very vulnerable mentally for, for quite some time afterwards. I didn't trust, you know, I see someone handing across a biscuit to someone. I'd be thinking, why not eat that? That's going to cause that. You're going to, you're going to have a heart attack. And, and thankfully I've got over that now. I'm eating biscuits again. <laughs> not, not too many, but um, the heart attack was a dark moment in some ways. In, in many ways, Graham, that I'm, having, I'm having a bigger challenge with a prostate cancer. That, that, that because the heart attack, I was able to get back the exercise. I've had my tests done and they're saying that I'm okay. I'm, I'm, my blood pressure is good, so I, I'm, I can take care of some of those things. After the prostate surgery, some of the side effects I'm left with, um, I find them a greater challenge. Yeah. So you, you did talk about that, about possibly now facing your greatest challenge, but you've also um, mentioned um, about the, the future looking bright, and you seem to have a, an overwhelming sense of hope. Um, is hope something that you think has, has helped you over the years and help you face those challenges massively massively i have i i, I have a i have a you know I, the, the prostate having the prostate removed and the side effects they're all not i'm not spoiling everybody's breakfast by going into the details of the side effects but they are they transform who you are as a man you know you're no longer you're no longer a man the way that you you always were um and, that, and you've got to find a new way to be but actually you know tomorrow tomorrow my four-year-old granddaughter comes to stay with me and tomorrow I go and play with her, and tomorrow I go and have time with her, and, and I get to see her and spend some time with her. And maybe the heart attack could have taken me away from that, and I never got that. So that's precious time, and I get to share that. You know, in, in April, in April, there's a book being published by Bloomsbury. I'm going to walk into a bookshop, which is remarkable. Well, my background to walk into a bookshop and see my see a book with my name on it is just it's just mind blowing for me. And our you know business wise, what I'm working now, we came through the pandemic. 
we're in a stronger position going forward. I'm, I'm, I'm very blessed to have been married to the same girl that I met when she was 13. I was 14 years old, and that's a, that's that's an amazing that's an amazing life to share. Yeah. Um. So you've talked about um the book um and you've now written two books and I did read the first book, the, the Irish Heartbeat, although you think many oh, people didn't. Oh, right. so, uh, and thoroughly enjoyed it. I know many people back in Northern Ireland have read it too. But um, you talk about writing and, and how that's helped you and how, the, how that helps you maybe deal with some of the challenges. Um, when we look at the, uh, the theme of today's webinar, turning it around, has writing, is writing something that you, you think has helped you turn life around and face those challenges? Has it been like a, a therapy? For... It's, it's been an enormous thing for me to be able to... Sometimes, as a man, um, I, I, I actually write about it in the book, and I call it cowardice on my part. I actually, it's actually, it's actually an easier place for me to write who I am, and then you read it, and then we can talk about it. And it is for me sometimes to tell you who I am, and tell you what I'm frightened of, or tell you that I'm, I'm not feeling good today. It's actually, it's actually, it's actually an easier place for me to get it. I can, I, I actually wrote the boy in the shed as honestly as I could possibly write it, and I've written this book to the point where it's beyond raw and it's honesty about my mental health, about my physical health, about the changes in me. And I, sometimes I'll say to Jordan, am I being too open here? Is this too, is this too much? And she'll say, just write what you want to write, get it on a page and no one ever reads it then, no one ever reads it. And I do think putting it out there on the somewhere does help without doubt, it helps me. Yeah. So you, you mentioned then that the best times are ahead and obviously there's there's plans for a new book and um, you've mentioned there um, a, a TV production possibly coming up, maybe it, like yeah. a... Sure, a wee bit of details on that, or maybe you can't share. The... No, I can. No, I was. Uh, yeah, I got approached by uh, 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 Los Angeles-based, um, English-based sort of production company who, who just before the pandemic took the film rights, and we're, we're we're in process of of turning that into a six-part TV drama. But they they were struggling desperately to find a little fat middle-aged man to play me at some. No, I'm joking. No, they 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 pushed on through the um. Pandemic and they're still in touch now and they're still doing it and they're moving. I think they're moving on to some kind of pilot stage with it, which is amazing. But all these things, Brian, anything I can't control, I, I try not to get too excited about. It. I just think that's a nice thing to be sitting in the distance. It's a bit like an Irish heartbeat. The production company doesn't have that. They, 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 they've employed a scriptwriter. He's written a script for it to turn, to turn that book that no one apart from you and me have read into into some in, in possibly into a film. Now, if they come off fantastic and, and brilliant, but actually, even if they don't. I'm still on a great journey with it anyway. Now it's still a great, it's still there's still great anticipation. And actually, there's another book coming down the line. I've got some other ideas of other things coming down the line. So, so I'm not going to stop. Yeah, great. But your, your sense of humour comes across, and I've seen people there and some of the the comments coming through about um, that being an important factor. Is that something that you think has helped you overcome your challenges? Help me overcome the challenges and overcome shyness. Sometimes I kind of use it as a, 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 a being honest with myself. I kind of use it as a as a, as a tool to, to, to overcome a bit of shyness sometimes, and, um, and I can get some person to share to share a moment like that with me. And uh, it feels like we're having we're having a bit of a more of a human connection because sometimes in my life, I don't know about you or anybody else out there, but most rooms I've ever been in when I was younger, even now I'm getting better at it. I tend to walk into a room and think, oh, everybody here's better than me. Everybody here's better than me. Everybody here. That's kind of just who I am, and that and. And I've got to work at that, and I, and I am working at that. And, and, and I stand in a room, and you could say to me, Paul, but you've got, you've got a mask with me, and you've got a bad barrister. And I'd still be saying, Well, I'm not, I've got that. That's, whether that comes from my, my, my childhood, it probably does. I don't know. So, uh, But I use humor all the time. And I love, if you can't have a laugh on me, what else? Come on, you be. Yeah. You definitely don't come across as shy today, Paul. If anything, <laughs> If anything, in the comments, people are saying about how open and honest you are, and, and I suppose that goes against the the myth that men don't speak. Um, and I suppose it's quite refreshing for a lot of the people here today to hear you being open and honest. Is that something that you think has been important, or that has helped you overcome the challenges that you've faced by talking as a man? If, if we'd have spoken fifteen years ago, I wouldn't have said a word to you, and I, and I genuinely, I would have been, I would have been, I, I've been in many a room when I was younger where actually I thought I want to speak and I want to speak and I, and I couldn't find my voice. And going doing the law stuff, I can remember even even the barrister stuff. To choose that as a thing to go and do, I actually almost think I chose it to, to force myself because I, I couldn't think of a more stressful place to be than having to stand up in the court with facing someone whose brains are bigger than yours and you're trying to argue. I think I think I think that helped. 
that definitely helped. And I think the success of the, the book has helped. And now, when you mentioned about being shy, once I start talking, my difficulty is stopping. Um, and, 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 and it's almost like I've got this pent up stuff that I want to I wanna get out, but it does, it helps me immensely talking. Yeah. Um, so it, it talked about good times being ahead and looking forward to the future. But when you look back, um, you talk about that step that you take to overcome your challenges. Is there anything that you specifically look back and think that was a massive regret and, and maybe that that wasn't a good thing to do at that time that, that maybe is good as an example for other men that are here at the minute? Yeah, the, 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 the massive regret was, I always say to my kids, the, the, the most important thing for me in life is if you take up something, stay the course, you know, stay, just stay, half the success is, you know, most of the success is the people who just stay the course. So the biggest regret is, is you go and you do two years and you study law and then you sell half your house and you go to bar school and you get called to the bar and then you have to go and compete with hundreds of, hundreds of people to get a pupilage with your like, gold. And then you do that and you're in and you're in and you're done. Don't jump off at that point, for goodness sake, you fool. Don't jump off what I did. But I did it at the time because my friend had a, was going to be a, 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 and it was going to be a manager. He was going to be a big manager. And I thought it seemed like the right decision at the time. So not so much regret. I just think I wish I continued that last three or four months of that journey because that would have made the next bit easier. If the, math, if, if the football thing hadn't happened, I could have jumped straight back in and started practicing law. Whereas once I jumped off it, I had to go back to the start of that pupils again, and I didn't have the finances or the will to go and do it. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so I, I was going to finish, Paul, by asking you um, if you had one final piece of advice for men, but I think you've answered it there by saying that um, stay the course and don't jump off despite the challenges and, and how, how important that is for men moving forward. And I, and, I, and I can only speak for myself. If you're not feeling good, if you're, if, you're, if you're not in the good, talk to the person that's right beside you. Talk to the person that, that, that wants to hear you because there is somebody there right beside all of us. That, that we, we're, not all the time, but we're very fortunate in life. I am, you know, she, she'd probably tell me off for saying this. I've got this, this, this quiet, strong presence in my life in Geraldine. I've had it since I've been 14 years old. She had more confidence in me in my life than I've ever had in myself. And, that's, that, and to be able to have that person to talk to, God knows how about her mind's like, her mind's like having, to, having to listen to me, but, but you know, just have, having, the, having that will to talk and also just know that for me, even the bad moments pass, and I've had some really bad moments, but I always tell myself, this is definitely going to pass. You know, it doesn't get darker than just your mother dying, and you're not, that's a dark place to be, and it's an awful place to be, but actually, I'm still here. Yeah. So despite all the challenges, Paul, things are looking good. What, what does the future look like for Paul first then? I know you're, you say you're facing your biggest challenge yet, but you, you seem optimistic about the future. Well, it looks good for me. I'm three years post therapy. therapy. I'm a, my, my, my PSA is negligible. The heart attack didn't kill me. The prostate cancer hasn't either. So I'm fortunate, I'm fortunate in that respect. I've got a second book coming. The business is, is going to go from strength to strength. And I have this thing where I once read an American bumper sticker and it said, if I'd have known grandchildren were this good I'd have them first. I feel exactly like that about my granddaughter. It's kind of, she, she just dominates our world and I'm, I'm long with that continue. Super. Paul, it's been fascinating. and I can see from the comments that people have uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, amazing story. Men don't speak, um, but as we get older, we make the effort. So people have thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'm sure at, at the question and answer session at the end, we'll have lots more questions. But Paul, th thank you very much for your time. I've really enjoyed it as much as the audience have. Well, thanks, Bran, and thank you, everybody, for listening, and I hope you'll speak to you later on. Thank you very much. Yeah, if you can just mute yourself and, and do the camera off there, Paul, and then we will introduce our, our second speaker of the day, Oshin. If you want to join us and turn your camera on and your microphone, and then uh, Colin is going to play your introductory video for the day, Oshin.
conversation. I'm, I'm smiling the whole way through that introduction, but um, you weren't smiling too much. So I, I wonder what, what are your thoughts when you watch an introductory video like that? Does it fill you with pride or? I just want people to know that I did not put that together myself. <laughs> it was something which was put together at, uh, for an event one time on the, uh, I just I held on to it because it's handy to have. Um, when you're watching that, I just think uh, that those a lot of those videos sort of stay on both sides of my uh, footballing career. The the side when I was um, very present, and the times where football was just something to uh, sounds dramatic, but at times football was something just to keep me alive. You know. Yeah. So, Paul, I obviously know your story and um, you're probably a wee bit more well-known than our last speaker, Paul, on the island of Ireland, north and south. But there will be some people here today that don't know who you are and maybe the video is the first um, introduction that they've had to you. So maybe it might be helpful for those people just to give a quick introduction as to who Oshie McConville is. Yeah, my name is Oshie McConville. I was born in a small village in South Armagh in 1975. Um, I grew up in the midst of the, of the troubles, I suppose. Um, anybody who knows Cross Midland and especially around that time, as I say, it was known as Bandit Country. And I suppose the only thing that we had outside of that was uh, Gaelic football. And I threw myself into Gaelic football at a very early age. And and to be honest, I loved it. And I just wanted the only thing I can remember as far as my childhood is concerned. Or oh, one of the main things I, I can remember is that I just wanted to be as good a Gaelic footballer as I could be. And to be honest, uh, you know, I set out about about doing that at, at probably four and five years of age. And and uh, football brought me to places that I thought I'd never see, and um, brought me success that I uh, that I was that I thought I'd never see. And um, we people always look at you know my career as being very very successful, but I suppose that wasn't exactly the path that I seen for it because there had been no history of, of that sort of in the area, as I say, that I grew up in. Or um, Certainly, if you look at our man, the way that they had gone down through the years. So um, that's football sort of uh, defined me uh, when I was growing up. Uh, it doesn't still define me, but it plays, but it plays a huge part in, in who I am and, and what I am. Yeah. So you talk there are pushing about sport from an early age and I know Paul talked about how sport uh, influenced him as a young as a young person and he, he was always going to be successful um, but we, it, we Paul also mentioned the influence that the troubles had and how they shaped them in early life and, and maybe how that's affected you then in later life can you relate to that? Yeah well I suppose you know when I was growing up I suppose you know 70s, 80s, early 90s uh, the area that I grew up in was dominated by the Troubles. I mean, uh, bombing, shootings, killings were commonplace day in, day out. Um, I suppose when I grew up, <clears throat> if you had asked me, you know, when I was primary school age, you know, how was the Troubles affecting me, I'd brush it off and I'd say, they don't affect me at all. It's just one of those things. That's just the way it is. In the area that I grew up in, when you were asked anything at that age, you were, you know, you were told to say nothing. And that's what we said, you know, if you're stopped by the police, you know, you say nothing. And uh, and sort of, I suppose, even though that was just in relation to, to certain things, it was something that I sort of latched on to. And when I latched on to it, I sort of, uh, I sort of brought it into my my everyday life. If you, if you can imagine, I walk past an army barracks every day to go to school. And when I say that out loud, I, I genuinely always thought that I walked past it. But now I know from five years of age that every time I got to that army barracks that I ran past it. And I continued to do that until I was probably 19 years of age. Even <clears throat> even to, to think that out loud and, and to realize, you know, that that did have some sort of uh, impactful um, message, I suppose, as far as my life was concerned. I remember my sister, I remember uh, uh, there was a, a bomb attack in, in Cross Midland and my sister was, she was walking up the road at the time and we were always told to throw ourselves, you know, on the floor, as, get as low as we can, cover our heads, all that sort of thing. Whenever, you know, if something like that happened. And I remember how she walked into the house and she was obviously in complete, complete shock. And uh, she was covered in head to toe in, in, in nettle stings and she didn't even realise it. 
uh, you know, when the bombs went off, we lived close enough to the barracks that, you know, all the windows would go in. Uh, it was like, it was like a military regime whenever, you know, those windows went in because we'd all go and get a separate dustpan and brush. We'd be designated to a certain window. We'd sweep up the glass. We'd board up the windows. A glazer would come that evening or the next day, uh, put the glass back in the window and we just got on with it life as we know it. I mean, I, I, as I say, I thought that was the norm until I went to school at 11 years of age. I went to the Abbey Grammar School in Newry and I realised that my background and, and a few of, of us who had gone to the Abbey Grammar School, our experiences growing up were not the same as other people, even though at that time we thought, as I say, that was just the norm. Um, so it, it, it did have a serious impact, but it was probably later in life when I realised just how much impact it had. You know, like when we went to train and, you know, regularly we, we maybe made a, a, a patrol and uh, they'd, they'd throw our, our stuff out in the ground and they make us put it back in the bag. And it was just, it just was constant harassment. And, and, uh, and as I say, it felt at the time as if... Uh, as if it, w it was the norm, but looking back on it, it was it was very much not the norm, you know. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of childhood trauma there, Oshin, directed or as a result of the troubles. But I've, I've also heard some of your interviews in the past, and you've talked about the challenges that you faced at, at an early age, and how you might have been very um, gifted with sport, but not really in terms of uh, academically gifted, and how that was a massive challenge in your early days. Yeah, I suppose uh, I went, I left uh, primary school. I, like Paul, did the 11 plus. Uh, I think the, the the grades at the time were an A, which was a pass, an M, which was somewhere in the middle, and a G, which was a fail. And I got an M. And I felt uh, happy enough going to a local um, secondary school, uh, which was literally, you know, two minutes from my house. Um, and I we played a game, a game of Gaelic football against a, a team in Newry and they also had a secondary school or a grammar school which was uh, the Abbey Grammar School in Newry and uh, I'd done quite well in that game um, and they had approached my mum and dad after the game and asked me if I would like to um, to go to that grammar school and, and I didn't particularly want to but my parents thought that this might be the kickstart of you know as far as the academic side of things so uh, I agreed to go and, and to be honest was probably happy enough to go in the end it's about for anyone who doesn't know Newry he's about 35 minutes away from me about uh, 17 mile uh, uh, on a bus um, when I went in there I had serious misgivings about the fact that you know uh, academically I wasn't sure if, as if it was going to be good enough um, and I suppose that's those insecurities raised our head after a couple of weeks um, when I realised that I was really struggling in all subjects apart from PE and after school football um, and those insecurities I think at 11 years of age put me searching for something else I uh, I I love my football um, uh, but I, I it wasn't enough anymore and uh, I went searching for something else. At 14 years of age, I walked into a bookmaker's and I had my first bet on a horse. Uh, 50 p each way I had on a horse in the Grand National, which I'm sure a lot of people on here will have had a, some sort of bet in the Grand National. It was very acceptable for a lad at 14 years of age to be in that bookmaker's. I mean, the bookmaker's was packed. Uh, there was, you know, me at 14, there was 80-year-old women. It was just, it was just, you know, as I say, fairly acceptable for me to be in there. But I was instantly attracted to everything in there. Um, I didn't spend that long, but I, I told myself I'd definitely be back. And two weeks later, I was back. The next time I come back, there was three people in the bookies. There was two gays who were having similar bets to me, probably a pound or two pound. And there was another gay who was taking wads of money out of his pocket. And I suppose as I was growing up and, and as far as sports people were concerned, I had a lot of uh, sports people that I looked up to soccer and Gaelic. And uh, and and I suppose that day, I think the, those heroes were sort of replaced by this guy who I seen as uh, I suppose a, a, a guy that I seen was successful. 
and successful in a manner and in a place where I wanted to be successful. Successful in a place that I felt comfortable. Um, and outside of a football pitch, that was probably the only place I did feel comfortable for the next 16 years. And uh, I started to take that baton and started to run with it. And uh, as I say, my bets were obviously very, very small at 14 and 15 years of age, but they increased as to the, the amounts of time I was spending gambling, as to the, the things I was willing to do in order to get the money to have the bet. And I suppose that's where my, uh, my, where my real problem started. Uh, I obviously was addicted from 14 years of age cause, because um, no matter how much money I had, I, I spent it on it. Regardless of whatever free time I had, I spent it uh, in the bookies. Regardless of uh, what I needed to do in order to get that money, you know, I was I. Uh, for a lot of people who don't really um, understand gambling as an addiction, uh, if you can imagine, we see very vivid images on television of people who are strung out in drugs and they'll do anything to get the next hit. Well, for for example, the next hit for me was just getting that bet on, and. The, the the buzz that that gave me initially then you know that buzz sort of went and then I was getting a buzz out of winning and then a buzz out of winning or losing believe it or not then a buzz out of just putting on the bet and then there was no buzz but I continued to, to gamble because I was addicted I couldn't arrest it I couldn't even arrest it for one day and uh, and that led me down a path of of doing things and hurting people along the way that that was never the intention, but uh, gambling was the was the overwhelming power in my life. Nothing else mattered when I was gambling. Nothing else mattered, you know, as far as me going in order to have a bet, I would walk across uh, broken glass in order to get into a boogies just to, to have that bet, and that's the hold that gambling had on me. Um, I suppose as well as that, uh, a serious event happened in my life in 1989. My father was diagnosed with cancer. He was given roughly five or six months to live. I didn't go and see my father during that time for a couple of reasons, but the main reason was there was way too much emotion around my father at that time, and, and I couldn't handle emotion. I hated happy occasions and Christmas and all those things, but I also uh, I hated sadness, and I couldn't deal with sadness. I, I, I hadn't cried a tear for... 16 years uh, physical pain or emotional pain um, but as I say my father was uh, spent most of his time in Daisy Hill Hospital in Uri during those six months um, as a footballer I was starting to get more and more successful Armagh um, was starting to win things we'd won our first Ulster title and don't worry if that means nothing to you we won our first Ulster title in 17 or 18 years so uh, it was a big thing for Armagh at that time Um we were playing Meath in an All-Ireland semi-final, which was probably the second biggest game you can play in as far as GA is concerned. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to play in that game because my father was literally on his last legs in the hospital. Um, but he sent word out that regardless of what happened to me, he wanted me to go and play in the game. So I went to play in the game. Uh, directly after the game, my cousin came rushing in the change room. He said, listen, don't get changed, just get your stuff. Um, put it in your bag and and uh, and we need to get up the road and we got a guard escort from Crow Park directly to the border and for the first time ever that day I said to myself that's it I'm actually never gambling again uh, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to do three things I'm going to tell my father I loved him I've never told him that before I'm going to tell my family what's been going on and I'm going to ask for help and uh, I continued that mantra it was just like a little mantra three things I kept getting up, going over and over them in my head and uh, Got to Daisy Hill Hospital. I'm about two yards away from walking into my father's room. And I did the same thing as I did for 20 years. I clammed up. I didn't tell my father I loved him. I didn't tell my family what was going on. I didn't ask for help. My father died on the Wednesday. And to be truthful and honest, only thing I could think about was where was my next bet or when was my next bet. Um, my father was buried on the Saturday. And I suppose when I talk about progression as far as the amount of money, so it had increased, the amounts of time had increased. But I think after my father, after my father died, the next part of that progression for me was the things I was willing to do in order to have the bet. So the values that I had, I had been taught, you know, growing up, you know, like I was begging, borrowing, stealing, hooking, scamming, scheming in order to feed my habit. Um, and I never felt as if that would be a road that I would go down. But 
I, gambling became uh, soon became desperation for me. Um, like my father died, I had no tears um, for my father. Um, not only had I no tears for my father, but it was actually two thousand and six when my when I'd been to treatment and I'd I'd uh, I had been in recovery that I went to my father's grave and I had a cry. And so it took me nigh on seven years before I processed uh, the grief uh, around that time. I wasn't just grieving though for, for my father. I was grieving for the fact that I had not been there for the rest of my family, that I hadn't been there for my mum, that I'd been rendered pretty much useless in that time. And, and to be honest, in any significant event, any time um, there was any... A crisis or uh, trauma within my family, I hadn't been there. I brushed it away and I, I continued on with my life because I was a compulsive gambler, a compulsive liar, and compulsively I was a very, very selfish individual. Um, I was ashamed, completely ashamed, completely embarrassed by what I was doing, um, but that still wasn't enough to stop me because gambling and, and addiction had me in the palm of its hand. It had me gripped and uh, as I say, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't arrest it. I couldn't even arrest it for one day. I couldn't even get one day's reprieve where I felt as if I was living the life of other people. Um, the other thing about um, about about the gambling and the other thing about uh, the looking for that reprieve was that it was so difficult to maintain that uh, image that people expected of you. So. Like if anybody's seen the start of that video, it was actually in 1999. Um, and in 19, 1999, um, I was the only Gaelic footballer in the country who wore his collar up. Uh, I think the only other person that I knew who did that in, in world football was Eric Cantona. And, uh, and I think he was genuinely confident, but I wore it up because I wanted people to think I was confident. I wanted people to think that everything in my life was perfect and it was going the way it should be going um, so it was a constant mask and in the end I couldn't stand that pressure anymore uh, the delays I couldn't handle the pressure of putting that mask on like I could spend days laying in, in my room with the covers over my head not wanting to see anybody and I knew if I had to go out to play a game of football or train I would stand at the door of my bedroom and I would compose myself and I'd put my hand over my face like that and I'd take it away. And as far as I was concerned, I was a new person when I went out through the door. I wouldn't just meet you and say hello to you. I could give you a high five walking down the street because I wanted you to think that there's that gay and he's got absolutely everything. You talk, um, obviously, uh, gambling has been a massive challenge in life and thankfully one that you've overcame. But you also mentioned at the start how uh, in your early childhood, um, I think you referred to it about um, say nothing. Um, if you were ever asked anything about the troubles or the police, the army spoke to you. And it seems to me that that was, that was nearly a, as big a challenge in your life as the gambling and maybe why the gambling became such of a challenge. You've mentioned not being able to speak to your father. Um, but yet you speak so openly and honestly today. Um, is that something that you have thought about in the past and how that's affected you? Well, I spent the majority, of my, <laughs> I spent the majority of my life saying nothing. And you know, I was listening to Paul, you know, talking about fifteen years ago. Well, definitely twenty years ago. I you'd said I could sit on here. You wouldn't get a word out of me. I could talk about football. I could talk about cars, or I could talk about women, or I could talk about the things that teenagers talked about. But I would never talk about feelings or emotions or anything like that there. And uh, not just even, not just even, you know, deep emotions or deep feelings, but even just the way I felt, even just the way I felt from, from day to day and the way I processed things and the way, like I had zero self-awareness. And uh, when you talk about, you know, saying nothing, there was also, a, a, I went into the Armagh change rooms at 17 years of age. Um, a lot of people in that change room were idols of mine, I suppose. Um, and when I walked into that change room, 
one of the things I heard first, now there was lots of things said, but this is the one thing that I heard, was leave your feelings at the door. And the thing about that was that that was just, I was just saying that was, you know, there's a lot of banter goes on, the change rooms, all those sort of things. But again, I talked that and I said, this is great. If I don't have to take my feelings into the change rooms, I could really prosper in here. And so I was emotionless. You know, I played football without a lot of emotion for a long time. And I think a lot of people, a lot of people see, you know, me, you know, after that, you know, scoring and different things got like and showing a huge amount of emotion. And the reason why I showed a huge, huge amount of emotion after 2005, after I came out of treatment, was that I had a lot of that stuff that was pent up. Uh, a lot of that stuff that had been inside me and now I was able to um, to express it in the way I want. But going back to, to childhood, I mean, like as I say, I, I would have seen that as fairly normal. My father would have shown zero emotion to me um, because his father before him would have shown zero emotion and, and you know, it, it was just passed down the lane. And one of the things that... Um, that I may tr that I remind myself of every day is that I need to show that to my kids because I'm not passing that down another generation. And you know, it's unbelievable when you know you get the opportunity to speak at events like this. And and no disrespect, because I know there's a huge amount of uh, women on on this, but you know, when when men speak and 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 men are given the opportunity to speak, it's um. It's a very powerful thing. I love listening to to other men speak about, uh, you know, about how they were emotionless or how they had lack self awareness and all that sort of thing. Um, and just like Paul, I have somebody here who I can, you know, come in and even if it's just to say, listen, I had a great day or I didn't have a great day. Even if it's only that, like I never would have shared that. I always would have said, listen, my life is so good. I sat beside uh, a gay in the change rooms for 20 years. That gay is no longer with us. And I went through 16 years of, uh, you know, a lonely, depressive uh, gambling addiction where I, like, I spent a lot of time on here this morning talking about myself and how it affected me. But I was affecting all of the people around me. I was affecting family members, affecting uh, friends, people I played sport with. Uh, but when we went into the change room, I'd say to him, how are you? And he'd say, great, absolutely brilliant. And he'd say to me, how are you? And i said, say, I'm even better. You wouldn't believe, you know, the way my life's going. You know, and I had the, you know, I wanted all the trappings. I wanted to, you know, when I went into a, into a pub, I wanted to buy a drink for everybody. I was penniless, but I wanted to buy a drink for everybody because it was about bravado and it was about what people thought of me and how I was going to keep, maintain that image. And, and uh, look, that's a, it's a, that's a very, very arduous thing to have to do for, for 16 years. And, and, and eventually the pressure got to me and I couldn't do it anymore. So you, you talk about trying to um, maintain this image and um, I've heard you speak before about how that image started to weigh on you more and more. Um, and is, is there a time, going back to the, the theme of the webinar, is there a time that you look back on and you can specifically pinpoint that time and think, that's when I started to turn things around or that's when I realized I had to turn it around and, and maybe explain how you did that at first? Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try and fly through this particular story, but I think this is probably... Uh, a large part of, of why things turned around for me. Um, I had uh, picked up a, a nasty injury and, and football had been taken away from me from a, a little bit for a little bit of time. Um, and I had ended up going to England to get a, an operation, which was uh, uh, which had only been done on five Olympic rowers before and it all gone on to win Olympic gold medals, but it never, they'd never done on anybody outside of that. And I was the first person. Uh, I went to, I flew from uh, from Dublin to, to Luton, I went to a uh, Bupa hospital in Luton, got a thing called a disc probe done. Um, I wasn't allowed to fly that night and they put me up in a hotel. So um, got a taxi from the uh, hospital back to the hotel where I was going to spend the night for because I had to get up for a seven o'clock flight the next morning. And on the way past, I seen a bookies. 
and I was still in active addiction. And in my ha- in my hand, in, in my pocket, sorry, I had five hundred pound and twenty pound notes, and that was all the money I had. No bank cards, no uh, change, no nothing. I had five hundred pound. And being a compulsive gambler, I thought it was a great idea to go back up to the bookies. So I went back up to the bookies, and the first thing I did was hand the girl behind the counter 20 quid and ask her for a tenner and two fivers. And I got 15 quid, and I rolled it up into the tiniest little ball you can imagine, and I put it in the front pocket of my jeans, a little pocket that's at the front of your jeans. Uh, and the reason why I did that, because that's how much the taxi calls from the, from the hotel back to the airport the next morning, say for a seven o'clock flight. And I started to gamble on the one that lost, and the one that lost, and the lost, and the lost, and the lost. And so the only money I had left in my pocket was 15 quid. For the first time ever, gambling started to affect me physically. And I started to shake uncontrollably in the bookies. Um, and there was about eight or nine other men in the bookies, and and the majority of them were laughing. And I knew they were laughing at me because... Um, because I say like I I I didn't know how to stop this. Well, I did know how to stop it to go out through the door. But realistically, with fifteen quid in my pocket, was that going to happen with a compulsive gambler? No. Um. So I went, I rode a docker. I put it fifteen quid in the horse. Horse was beat, and I walked back. I managed to scramble out of it. The best way I can describe it is. I had contemplated crawling on my hands and knees through the door of the boogies, but I managed to scramble my way out one way or another, and I went back to the hotel, and I set my alarm for three o'clock in the morning, and I got up at three o'clock in the morning, and I walked eight and a half miles from the hotel back to the airport for a seven o'clock flight, and for the first time ever, I had suicidal thoughts, and I thought every large vehicle I can pass was going to throw myself in front of it, and I started a little mantra in my head because I needed something to get me to the airport. And except for this time, I didn't have to tell my father I loved him because he was dead at that stage. But uh, I was going to tell, I was going to tell my family what was going on. I was going to ask for help, and I continued that. And, and I got on the plane, I managed to get to the plane, get to the airport, get to the plane, flew into Dublin. Same thing. Uh, continued those two little lines um, into a car. Didn't speak a word. Got in. Got home. I'm um, sitting having dinner with my mum at the table. And uh, I beg him, I'm begging myself in my head, I'm begging myself just to say something to her because I know that's going to be the turning point uh, or the turning things around him. And, uh, and I didn't tell my mum. And my mum uh, got up off the table for, I don't know, whatever she was doing. And within five minutes, I had taken every penny in her bag, everything, anything in the kitchen that was worth anything. And 20 minutes later, I was in the boogies and the dog having a bet. And uh, the thing about after that bet, I realized just how much of a hole gambling it on me. And I started in the process of being a little bit more self-aware. Now, I'm talking about a little bit more self-aware. Uh, and I, I got the impression I was never going to beat this on my own. But I was going to have one more crack at at one big bet. In my head, I said to myself, you know, I don't want to even talk about figures, a significant amount of money, but I ended up going and getting a, a loan out of a credit union for £20,000, and I went and I put it on a horse. Um, and I didn't ha- I didn't know who the jockey was, the trainer was, I just picked it off the screen. I watched the race, the horse was beaten, I had zero emotion, no emotion left. I left the bookies and I went back out to the car and I got, eight quid together and I went back into the boogies and that just shows the insanity of where I was at that time um, because I thought I'd win all that money back but I think probably this is you know the nub of, of my gambling is that I like a lot of people associate gambling with finances I, I like finances yeah I wanted to win money but I only wanted to win money so I could gamble again but I walked into that bookies as a 14 year old lad and I wanted to win back the insecurities from the 11-year-old. I wanted to win back the relationships, the friendships, the family members that I was losing along the way. I wanted to win back the self-respect and the self-esteem. Now, there's a lot of people on here who are probably going, well, Ashin, you're never going to get that in the bookies. I know that now, but at that time, I didn't know that. I thought that was my only chance. And uh, I... the. When I left the bookies that day, I flicked down through my phone to see who could the next victim be for uh, to borrow so I could borrow money off or hit for money. 
And I realized that I bore me bridges with everybody on that phone. And then I said, what if I was to ask for help? And I flicked around through my phone again. And I thought, I convinced myself, because all my talk was self-talk. I never talked to anybody else. All my talk was self-talk. So I was able to convince myself different things. Um, but um, I convinced myself there was nobody on that phone. But I got home. My brother and sister were there. And for some reason, I, I broke down. <clears throat> and I started to cry. And as I say, I hadn't cried with physical pain or emotional pain for 16 years. Uh, and I started to cry and I started to tell them little bits of what was going on. Um, and a week later, I was sitting in front of a, a nun in Tipperary. And uh, I'd been brought up to never curse in front of a nun. But she told me, she was the first person to tell me that I was addicted. And I hated her for it. I really did. Because... I had got to 29 years of age believing that people who were addicted were laying on park benches with a bottle of wine and a brown bag around it. Now, can you imagine a lad? It just shows you the, the bubble that I was living in. That I looked in the mirror and I thought, I don't fit the profile of somebody who's addicted. Uh, yet, I was more addicted than anybody I ever met or ever knew. And, uh, oh, sorry, as addicted. Um, and, uh, and and that started the process of recovery. I was in a treatment centre the following week, spent 13 weeks there, and I started to learn about recovery, learn about where I was. I started to learn a lot about the hurt that I had caused to my family uh, because a lot of that I was oblivious to. Um, and once I started to uh, process that sort of thing, I had an opportunity, just a chance, a chance of recovery. Amazing, Oshin. Oshin, your, your story, very inspirational, and I can see a lot of the comments coming through. Um, someone saying there that it's um, scarily close to Paul Merson's story, and we've discussed that already, but um, <clears throat> your, your story, a, a lot of similarities to Paul, our first speaker, but some things are, are, are very different in terms of Paul's ability to speak openly and honestly from a very young age. You really struggled with that. Um, and was that the turning point for you in life in terms of overcoming them challenges once you took that first step to, to open up and talk? I think uh, the process of change for me was, as I say, that day that I, that I, I sat in front of my mum and didn't take the opportunity. I knew at that stage then that I had that w what my issue was. Uh, I had a fair idea uh, how I was going to turn it around. Um, but I think when I got to treatment... Um, the, and like I spent the majority of my t uh, treatment with people who uh, were struggling with alcohol issues um, and I seen these people getting physically better if you know what I mean like they, they were physically mending in front of my eyes and then they were starting to talk and I was still reluctant to talk after about three or four weeks in there uh, and then I, I, I had a one-to-one -one counsellor um, and the one-to-one -one counselor uh, told me, unless I, uh, I applied uh, my sporting attitude to my recovery, I wasn't going to make it. So that's what I did. So I sort of, I, I went, you know, full time at trying to convince myself to open up. Um, and once I did that, um, it became a lot easier. It was a very unnatural thing for me to do. And when you do it, initially there's a great freedom in it, but you also need reminded every so often that that's the way it is. I often talk about during lockdown, things were starting to get to me a little bit, in particular um, around the kids. They've been cut off from school. They've been cut off from sport. They've been cut off from absolutely everything. The anger was building up inside me because I could see how it was uh, affecting, in particular, one of them. Um, and uh, I, I held on to that for weeks. And eventually, one day, I just something clicked inside my head, and I said, "I need, I need to share this." And I went down, and I said to my wife, and she said she was feeling the exact same way. And we started to talk about it, process it, and literally, instantly, I feel better. Not only do I feel better, but I'm proactive about it now, because I'm 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 honest, and I'm uh, I'm determined that you know there's things we can do in order to help him. Because of the lockdown, like it was only simple stuff like missing his friends and all that sort of thing, 
but there was proactive things that we could that we we could have been doing that I could have been doing certainly in those couple of weeks where you know I was letting that anger build up inside me and I was keeping it in there. It's like layers for me. If you can imagine, like everything that I hold back and I don't share, it's just layers. And if you can imagine the layers that kept going up and up and up and up and up, and I was drowning in all those layers. Um, and and but once I, once that once something comes now and I relieve myself of it, I'm never going to be drowning in it again, unless I let those things, you know, uh, accumulate and 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 uh, and I just don't do that anymore. So uh, I learned a lot about about opening up, uh, but it took me. 30 years and all that to, um, to be able to do that. Yeah. I'm conscious that we're getting close to time. Yeah. A couple of things just, um, I suppose Paul talked about the, the therapeutic side of writing um, and how that has helped him maintain that turning it around actions. Um, what specifically has helped you maintain that? Or um, I know you're working with uh, Sport and Chance now. Is that something that similar to Paul's therapy that has helped you? Yeah, I suppose like when Paul talks about writing stuff down, I would have spent all of my treatment for the three months, you know, consistently writing stuff down, uh, trying to make amends to people that I'd hurt along the way. Um, so I did a little bit of writing then. Um, as far as sport and chance is concerned, I mean, like it's great therapy for me to be able to talk about my story. So this is my therapy this morning to talk about my story, remind me of where I was at um, and realize that I'm, that I'm so grateful that I'm not in that position anymore. Um, I'm dealing with sports people the majority of the time, um, professional or amateur. Um, and I suppose the variety of, of stories, you know, and the variety of addictions and the things that are affecting people um, is one thing. But like you, you asked me, you know, about, you know, the things that had affected me when I was growing up were probably more than the, more than the gambling. The gambling was really just how I, you know, uh, I suppose I masked all that stuff. It, it could have easily been drugs or alcohol or something else. Um, it just happened to be gambling for me. But it, it, it's 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 not the actual action, if you know what I mean. The 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 active addiction. It's it's what's making me do those things, and and I think. Uh, that's the great thing about learning and, and the awareness of, of addiction that we have now is that, you know, like if I'm speaking to a rugby league player who's, uh, who's you know, addicted to prescription drugs or a, or a Premier League player who's addicted to, to gambling or, you know, a, 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 lad, a lad in the GAA or rugby or whatever that's addicted to, to alcohol, it's it's peeling it away and find out what's going on in the background. That's that's the big thing for me, and I think uh, there's a lot of learning that. And 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 I don't know if Paul. I know Paul actually sits down and you know and writes like memoirs and all that sort of thing, and he's very talented at doing that. I, I, my thing is uh, lists because anybody out there who has you know young kids, we have three young kids, nine, seven, and three. Um, I, we need lists all the time. And, and I, I don't want to be in the situation again where, as I say, that stuff is layering up on me. So if I have things to do or I have things to do, I need to write those down, prioritize them, rub them out when they're done and move on to the next list. So I'm, I'm somebody who writes stuff down but for a completely different reason. Both both have therapy in the in the writing machine. Then, Wishing, well, thank you very much. It's it's been absolutely inspirational. No problem. I can just see from the comments coming through that people have absolutely loved um, how open and honest you and Paul have been. Um, we have a, a bit of time left, and I know we have some questions submitted. So I'd maybe like to invite Paul back on. Um, Paul, if you want to come back on, and we can do some of the questions and answers that the audience have submitted. Technical difficulties again. Hi. It's the, the joys, the joys of Zoom. Paul, welcome back. <laughs> um, so again, just like to thank you very much. Um, the audience have ab absolutely loved it, but we have had some um, questions coming through. Um, you both touched on the, the subject of proving yourself um, and trying to prove that you weren't a failure. Um, and I suppose maybe to you, Paul, first, has has that been a big part of overcoming challenges in life? 
Uh, very much for me. It's not a, it's a, I'm not sure it's a healthy place to be sometimes, but I think my, my drive to go and do things later in life all came, I think, from just the huge disappointment of not being the success that, that maybe my family and everybody else hoped that I would be when I left home. You leave home in a blaze of glory and you, you play in the first team when you're 16, the youngest player to play for Newcastle United. It, it definitely doesn't, it doesn't end the way, it doesn't end the way it did for me. It shouldn't end the way it did for me. And I, and I felt, even when I was talking to my mum that day, when, when I said, and she, and she was worried about me, I couldn't bring myself to go home. I had no home, no income, injured. My mum was saying, come home. And I couldn't bring myself to go home and face my family because I just didn't want to go home as a failure. And when I did go home, I don't know, I, oh, she, I mentioned something before about talking to people who are always like boasting about how well they were doing. When I did go home, even even when I was in my worst point with no income, you'd meet people at home and they'd say, how are you doing? You'd say, oh, I'm doing really well. I'd say, you must be doing really well. You live in England. And I'd say, yeah, I live in England. I haven't got a home and I haven't got a job. So my, my fear of failure has driven me all of my life, but it comes from the it comes from the failure of the football career that I thought I was going to have, in my case. Yeah. And I'm sure, I know in terms of um, the sporting career, yours lasted slightly longer than Paul. So was overcoming failure something that, that has driven you over the years? And I know you touched on it briefly. Uh, probably early on, I, I found it very difficult to handle failure. Um, and I think uh, very, very difficult to uh, to process it because it was it always I always made it fall back on me even though it was you know 15 20 players who who play in a match uh, I always took felt the onus was on me and uh, and I suppose I learned over the years with through experience and through recovery um, that um, it wasn't on me and it was things outside of that and I I seen success in different ways I always seen success by how many medals I had um, and then I started to see it as um, football was still very important uh, hugely important but I, but I then seen it as you know the biggest battle I've ever had in life and the biggest win I've ever had in life was first of all getting into recovery and then being able to maintain it um, so everything else I tried to put in perspective after that so it takes on a little bit more perspective now if people see me coaching and on the sideline at the minute they'd probably say nah <laughs> that's, that's not exactly true but look at it, it it's as I say it still plays a huge part it's a very important part of my life but it's in perspective now I think that's that's probably the, the way the better way of describing it yeah super Thanks, Ocean Paul. Um, we have another couple of questions in there. So, um, obviously, Paul, you're still going through some challenges. Ocean, I suppose you probably consider yourself um, a gambler for the rest of your life, and it's a continuous challenge that you'll face. But have you seen any challenges in recent times in how men can access help and support? Do you think that's improved now? Um, do you think there's more support available now than there was maybe when, when you were younger? Paul, maybe do you want to go first for that one? Yeah, I, I think from from my, I think it's vastly different. I think I think whenever I whenever I was sixteen, say you're sixteen years old and you and you leave home and you and you you to be even in, even in the football world, I can only speak in that world. There's absolutely there was absolutely zero vetting of the house that I went to to stay in the digs that I went to. There was zero pastoral care. If I'm if I'm crying myself to sleep on a night time and coming in the train the next day. No one's really interested in what you do after you leave the training ground. They're interested in how well you perform the training ground, how well you, how well you fit into the team, and they see, oh, you're flying today. You're looking fantastic today. No one stopped for a second. There was no one around the place to say, "Are you okay? You're a 16 year old boy away from your family, and and maybe you're not happy, and maybe you need some help." So that 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 I can only speak from that world. That changed while I was in football. I spent 18 years in football as a physiotherapist, and that changed dramatically by the time I'd left. And I'd, I'd like to think, and I wish you might know more about the sport and chance stuff, because of organisations like that and other ones like that, there's much more opportunity for someone to seek help. Whether whether they have the courage to seek that help or have the desire to seek that help is another matter. But but in terms of in terms of pastoral care for people in sport, that where, where I came from, absolutely yes. And in general in life now, the, the journey I'm on now, if I'm being really honest, it's kind of there on the prostate cancer journey, and it's kind of there when you when you're talking to doctors and medical people. But I still don't think it's right there at the forefront of of, of your treatment. It's still about the physical treatment sometimes, and about are, is your cancer okay? Are you cured from that? Are you are are you are you coping with the side effects? Are you are you 
are you still wearing countenance pads or are you doing whatever it is? Sometimes it's it's not that question of how are you? And just that question of how are you? And maybe asking that question more than once because I've been asked it a few times and lied a few times. Even now I lie, I've lied to doctors. They've said, how are you? And I've said, I'm fine. When I wasn't fine. And that's the challenge still. It, I, even me and you say I speak openly. Sometimes I'm frightened to say I'm not fine because I don't want to, I don't, sometimes don't want to, I just don't want to face up to the fact that I'm not fine. But it, but yet I'm rambling. But yes, I think there's more help in general. Oh, she knew you with the sport and chance stuff. I think you probably have more of an insight into that than me. Yeah, I think I think just exactly what Paul says. I think we've come a long way. A lot is has been done, but there's a lot more to do. I think uh, you know I see it in in uh, in professional sport. I know when I walk into a club, the club that is in uh, that is taking this stuff seriously, and the, the clubs that maybe aren't, and a lot of that depend depends on the person who's at the helm. So the person who's at the top of the tree. Uh, you know, you walk in sometimes and, you know, the welcome you get and, and the fact, you know, that maybe a manager will take the time out of his day to sit into that to that meeting yeah. um, and, and take it seriously. Uh, I think a lot of managers see the value in it as far as, um, like, let's say, let's go away from sport for a second. You know, if you're sitting in the office with 20 people and there's five of them who... Uh, away from the office, aren't happy whether it be relationships or whether it be addiction or whether it be financial issues or whether it be whatever. Uh, you're not getting what you you know. You're not getting uh, as much out of them as as you could. And I think sport, when it comes to sport, is the exact same thing. I think um, that when you uh, challenge somebody or um, challenge your own perceptions <clears throat> and subsequently look into what's going on in people's backgrounds and how happy they are when they come into the change rooms and if that happiness like me like if if you ask one of my managers you know what was i like they'd say i oh, know he's fine nothing wrong with him but the, the thing that paul also touched on is that whenever i went into treatment i got outside of my family and one friend i got two phone calls one was from my club manager and one was from my county manager. And they both asked me the same thing. When are you done in there? When can you get back playing? Yeah. Yeah. We have come... A, that sounds like as if, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ridiculing those two men. Yeah. I'm not. That's exactly where we were at that time. But we're not there anymore. We've, we've come on leaps and bounds. But as I say, we've come a long way, but we have so much more to do. I think uh, there's, a, there's so many more. It's, this is a thing which... You know, if we want to go back to the cancer thing, like if you think of how many families have been hit, uh, you know, that that has come home to roost. And, and you don't really think about it until it comes to your own door. And it's almost the same with mental health and, and addiction is that, you know, you take real um, notice of it whenever it comes to... Uh, whenever it comes to your own door and you have to start to deal with it then. And I think if you bring that in then to your work life, or sporting life or whatever it is, um, it's so much more helpful and so much e easier uh, to convince somebody that this is a good idea, that you need to, uh, that you need to be very much aware of this as far as your work, uh, your staff or your, uh, or your, uh, your the people who are sitting in your change rooms, and I think if you if you have that, then um, I think if you're looking an increase in production uh, or productivity or performance, look no further than how people are uh, with their mental health. Yeah. 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 I'm on mute there. So the dog was barking in the background. <laughs> so ho hopefully things are improving. Support is improving for men. Um, and definitely today, by talking so openly and honestly, we're starting to break down that barrier that men don't talk. And I suppose that's been one of the biggest lessons for me personally, is that it was that willingness to talk and um, the willingness to be open and honest and, and reach for help, ask for help that, that has maybe really changed and turned your lives around. Um, so that's something that I think that, that our audience can definitely take away. We have a couple of few quick questions before we finish. Uh, this one for Oshin then from uh, Sean McGreed. So Sean has asked Oshin, 
How much do you feel your work as a pundit in the media with second captains, BBC and RTE has continued to aid your recovery? I've always felt your analysis is without agenda and apart from Tyrone, the odd time, keep up the great work. So maybe maybe not as without agenda then, but is that something <laughs> something that has that has helped you and continues to help you? Yeah, no, the, the Tyrone hurts of, of the past. I, I'm still getting therapy for the, for those, so uh, that's a that's a I'm a work in progress as far as that's concerned. But um, I just think that when it comes to stuff like that, punditry and and sometimes you feel as if it's not really real life, and, and that and that you know some people take themselves a little bit too seriously when they're talking about like this is sport. This is something which, like, if I can't go on TV, well, if I can't, without going on, if I can't talk about Gaelic football, then I, I, I don't know what I can talk. I don't know what I'm qualified to talk about because that has been my life from those four years of age. I mean, like, um, my mom is 85 and she still asks me, what do you want to do with your life? So uh, that gives you an idea of how much I have bounced from one thing to another. Um, but look, a punditry has given me the opportunity to, uh, I suppose, to, to 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 drip feed some of the stuff that that's going on outside of uh, outside of of just the sport, like as in the mental health stuff and that, and how important it is to have those uh, change rooms and what the setup in that change room should be. So. Um, yeah, look at it. it's 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 brilliant for me, um, and it gives me, as I say, a, a platform to talk about maybe other things as well, and I think that that is more significant than just the sport. Yeah, super, and it's great to have that platform that you can um, talk in that way, Oshin. So, last question, Paul. Then, um, so what has been the most important lesson that you have learned in life? Quite a hard one to finish on. <laughs> it's an easy one for me to, to believe in myself more. I wish I, I wish I believed in myself more when I was younger. If I'm being really honest, that would be my, my strongest my strongest message to anyone is is it just feel just I know it's a little cliche, but you know anything that's that makes you feel a bit of fear in life is worth having. Sometimes just put yourself in that position and put yourself in that slightly uncomfortable position if you want to move forward and not be frightened to take that chance. Yeah, super. And Oshin, if if you were to answer the same question. Um, important lesson in life so far. Hopefully, there are still many lessons still to learn for you both, obviously. But just just to date, well, I'm learning lessons all all the time because I mean, my wife actually asked me, you know, what was uh, this in relation to today, and I said it was. Uh, I, I I said men's day, and uh, she said, "Is it not men's day every day?" So uh, that's another learning. For, for me today but uh, I think the biggest thing that, that I learned is that you know we are all a work in progress like I genuinely like when I studied you know addiction counselling and became an addiction counsellor and you know I had spent 500 hours counselling people I'll be honest with you I, there was a time a short window where I thought you know what I've cracked it I know it all but uh that's you. You soon change from that, and I think I, I'm learning. You know, every single day, and and the only way I can learn, continue to learn, is is to be as open and honest as I can. And um, if I I know that a little bit like that little period in lockdown, that when I start holding things back, that that's a dangerous time for me. So um, that's the biggest lesson that I learned is I not only is it important to open up, but it's important to continue that process um, and it continues to open up. Brilliant. Thanks. Listen, Paul and Oshin, thank you. We're, we've unfortunately ran out of time, but I think everyone will agree we probably could have sat here for another couple of hours. I know I definitely could have, but Mark has a comment that I think is a, a very fitting way to finish and, and reflects probably everybody's thoughts for today. So Mark Wilson has said, I've listened intently throughout this webinar, which potentially could be a first. Thank you both for today. I will be taking what I've heard and learned back, not only to my colleagues, but to my family and friends. Thanks, guys, for sharing and making a difference to my day. Maybe I can pay this forward. And I thought that was maybe a lovely comment and just a, a nice way to finish. And, uh, so again, Paul Oshin, thank you very much. Um, 
for all of the, the audience that have came along today, um, thank you very much. We've really appreciated your time. We hope you've enjoyed it as much as, as I have uh, talking to the guys. I hope you've taken something away from it. Um, for some of the stuff that we've discussed today, Colin will share some information after today's webinar with some uh, email uh, follow-up. Um, so you will receive that hopefully by email tomorrow. Uh, a caveat to that is that everybody that attended today and that completes the uh, evaluation survey that Colin will email to you will be entered into a draw for a Fitbit watch. So if that is something that you're interested in winning after today's event, then we would encourage you to complete the survey. But again, just to finish off, thank you again very much. Um, as I said at the start, this is the first of, of hopefully many uh, events that we as a, a men's health group will take forward. Um, and again, Ocean and Paul, thank you very much. I really enjoyed today.